welcome back. Now we're on chapter two. <clears throat> we rode all night toward the star that shines in the north, the one that never moves. Spread flat on my stomach, I was fastened to the back of a horse. My hands were tied together around the horse's neck by a stout leather rope. I rode at the very end of the train, the end of the long line of horses and captured women. My captor, the tall one, rode in front of me. He never spoke. Several times when he seemed asleep, I thought of leading my horse out of the line, hiding in the woods and somehow untying the rope that bound me. But what if I failed? What if I was forced to wander for days until I died of thirst, until I was a skeleton tied to a skeleton horse? And what of running deer? What would happen to her if I escaped or died? It was bad to think of escaping, and I put it out of my thoughts. Surely my father and my two brothers would be home from the buffalo hunt in a few days. They'd find our camp burned down and the dead people lying on the burned grass, and they would set off to rescue us. Near dawn, the train halted beside the stream we had been following all night. My captor unbound the ropes and told me to drink because I would not see water again that day. We were still in the low mountains and it was very cold. The stream ran under a crust of ice. I had to break a hole in it before I could drink and wash my face. That's pretty cold. Dawn came as I left the stream. By its light, I had my first real look at the minotaury. Older than my father, he was a tall, thin man with a small head, round like a melon which sat squat between his shoulders. He picked up the rope to tie me and said, touching his chest, Tall Rock, which I took to be his name. He then spoke a few words, and when he saw that I did not understand them, he made a sign with both of his hands, drawing a shape. He rolled his eyes. He started to pick me up to put me on the horse. As he bent forward, I saw hanging from his belt, down the back of his leg, a woman's scalp. The hair was long and black and braided. Through the braids were woven tiny pieces of white fur, ermine fur. It was my mother's hair that hung from his belt. A scream caught in my throat. Wild words formed on my lips. I said nothing. Quietly, I walked to the place where I had made a hole in the ice and washed my hands again and picked up a rock. The minotauri was standing by the horse, mumbling at the delay. When he gathered me up, I brought the rock down on his head. It was a solid blow, and he reeled and fell to his knees. I ran for another rock, a bigger one. But as I reached the stream, he shoved me from behind so hard that I went crashing through the ice. After a few moments, while I froze, he dragged me out by my hair, through the sand, through the grass. He tossed me on the horse and bound me again, tighter this time. Then he gave me a good hard slap on both of my cheeks. We traveled all that day in heavy rain, not stopping until dusk. While I was being untied, running deer came to watch, followed by a minotauri with roached hair who stood off at a distance. She was surprised to see me tied up. I have a good horse to ride, she told me, one of our horses. Do you think we can steal away tonight when they're not looking? We don't know the trail, I said and the rain has washed out all the hoof prints the horses have left. We'd be lost before morning. That is why when no one was looking, I broke off twigs all day and dropped them along the trail. We can't find twigs in the dark, but tomorrow in the daylight they could be found. Tomorrow we will see. I asked her how many of our people were in the train. Five or six, I think, women and boys. Tall Rock came and stood in front of us and made motions pointing to the way we had come, then drew a finger swiftly across his throat. Running Deer and I did not talk anymore. The next day, while thunder rolled and lightning streaked the sky, one of our women, Little Fox's daughter, walked away from the train. She had not gone very far when the Minotaurs overtook her. I heard a scream, and that was all. My cousin and I never talked again about trying to escape though she kept breaking off twigs as we rode, dropping them on the trail for our men to see. I kept count of the direction, which was no longer toward the star that does not move, but toward the rising sun. Which way is the rising sun, boys and girls? When the sun rises, it's in the east, toward the mountains, right? A new moon came and slowly went. 
We reached running water, the River Missouri, but my father and my two brothers never came to rescue us. On the morning of the day we first saw the river, the Minotauris smeared fresh paint on their faces and stripes up and down their chests. And when we reached the river, they let out the cries of crazed devils. Ay, 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 they shouted, spurring their weary horses. As we rode into their village, an old man tottered out to greet us. He had thin white hair and moved with the help of a stick carved in the crooked shape of an antelope horn. This was the Sachem of the Minotauris, the father of the people of the Willows, the great chieftain, Black Moccasin. He had a nod for all of his new captives. He went from one to the other of us, squinting his flinty eyes, examining us from head to toe as if we were mares he was about to buy or had bought and was not quite sure of the bargain. His gaze lingered on me. I held my breath knowing that my fate among the people of the willows was being decided. His gaze shifted back away to running deer and then came back to me. He had not decided what to do, but Tall Rock, who had waited impatiently, reached out to drag me off. Quick as a snake strikes, the chieftain tripped him with his carved stick and sent Tall Rock sprawling in the dust. And that's the end of chapter two.